the personal empowerment is about our quest with the outside world, with reshuffling our relationship with people and things and what has power over us in the outside world and how we are in our relationships. Hi everybody. I'm going to do an unusual archetypal video today. Uh, unusual for a number of reasons. One is I'm going to start by referencing the life of Eddie E-T-T-Y Hillisum, this woman. And this is her journal, her diary. And the subtitle is An Interrupted Life and in Letters from Westerbrook, which was a concentration camp in Holland. And the um, archetype we're going to go into is the liberator, but not the liberator in terms of liberating others, but self-liberation, a different turn, a different twist on this archetype. Because I, I think in this era of self-empowerment, I think there's, there's a need to understand the difference between the search for self-empowerment and the quest to self-liberate. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to start by, um, first of all, this is her diary that, that survived, and she did not. Uh, she was Jewish. And um, one of the cur synchronicities is that she began work in, in Westerbrook on the 15th of July, 1942, um, about the same time a girl named Anne Frank, hidden in a house a few miles away, began her diary. But I wanna start with the first page of, her, of Eddie's diary, which is Sunday, March 9th, 1941. And she reads, she writes, here goes then. This is a painful and well nigh insuperable step for me yielding up so much that has been suppressed to a blank sheet of lined paper. The thoughts in my head are sometimes so clear and so sharp and my feelings so deep, but writing about them comes hard. The main difficulty, I think, is a sense of shame. So many inhibitions, so much fear of letting go, of allowing things to pour out of me, and yet that is what I must do if I am ever to give my life a reasonable and satisfactory purpose. It is like the final liberating scream that always sticks bashfully in your throat when you make love. I'm accomplished in bed, just about seasoned enough, I should think, to be counted among the better lovers, and love does indeed suit me to perfection, and yet it remains a mere trifle, set apart from what is truly essential, and deep inside of me, something is still locked away. The rest of me is like that too. I am blessed enough intellectually to be able to fathom most subjects, to express myself clearly on most things. I seem to be a match for most of life's problems, and yet, deep down, something like a tightly wound ball of twine binds me relentlessly, and at times I'm nothing more or less than a miserable, frightened creature, despite the clarity with which I can express myself. <clears throat> I'm, I'm absolutely in awe of this woman. But more than that, I'm in awe of how she captured how she struggled with wanting to liberate herself, liberate this extraordinary spirit inside of herself, and that she managed to do that in service to all of these people who were ghettoized in Holland during World War II when the Nazis came in, and then in Westerbrook, which is where she ended up with them. So I want to talk about the personal liberator as this archetype that I think is sometimes unidentified 
and our quest for personal empowerment. So what is the difference? You know, personal empowerment is, first of all, I think everybody is on that search one way or another. And pardon the mess in my office, you see all these books. I'm clearing out things. I'm giving away 50% of my library now. Um, the personal empowerment is about our quest with the outside world, with reshuffling our relationship with people and things and what has power over us in the outside world and how we are in our relationships and with stuff and with addictions and with um, things. And, and we have to start there. You know, we have to start by becoming aware that we can have boundaries and that what those boundaries are. And, but essentially, you know, what we're discovering is how precious our power is. There's a new word people use now. It's called agency to realize you have agency, right? But what it all comes down to is realizing that the most precious substance we have is not stuff, but it's our power. It's this thing called our power. And that every little exchange we have with anything, even with an idea, even, even with a, 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 a thought, requires units of power, requires units of our power. And every exchange with a person Every exchange with anything is an exchange of our power with that person. And that we, we are living at a time where we are beginning to discern that fact, which, which makes the management of our power so incredibly precious, so incredibly vital to our well-being. Um, and I, I've realized that and I realized it long ago that so the many um, people that struggle with depression and anxiety, and these are really power disorders. They are our inability to understand how our power works and where we're hemorrhaging and, and what perception can arise in us that can trigger a panic attack that can trigger our power to respond in a way that immediately disempowers us, that it's a perception and that it can grab hold of us. And it's just a perception. And so we are always now in this battlefield with what is inside of us and what's triggered by the outside and our capacity to manage that, to control that to control the stimuli on the outside world. And it's never ending. So there's the battle with <clears throat> power in this outside world. But what we're trying to do is liberate ourselves from being controlled. So this is the difference between empowerment and liberation to be able to actually get to a stage where you recognize that you are liberating yourself from triggers in the outside world, from triggers on the inside world. And I think it first starts, we always have to start, I think, with something on the outside world that we can spot, that we can see, that we can hear, that we can engage with because that that's a culprit that we can recognize and we can liberate ourselves like that we can like for example liberating yourself from a relationship that is hostile or not good for you or whatever but then the harder work is to liberate yourself from interior patterns that have authority over you interior voices that have authority over you um, that hold you back. And that's why I found Eddie's 
diary, so exquisitely brilliant, because that was her target in her life, was to liberate herself from inner patterns that suffocated her creativity, that suffocated her sexuality, that suffocated her her capacity to enjoy freedom no matter where she was. Even when she ended up in a concentration camp, even then she refused, refused to see herself as a prisoner and she would focus on the sky and she would focus on on, on flowers and she would focus on other things and she would try and generate that a sense of liberation for however short a period of time into the lives of other people because she refused, refused to imprison her soul, even though her body was. Obviously, she couldn't just walk through the fence, a barbed wire fence, but she could frame it within herself. And I think this is that sense of liberation that I believe every single person is actually striving for. is a sense of liberating yourself from those um, restrictions that somehow or other hold you back from your capacity to respond to your creativity, to respond to your deeper emotions. You know, um, when I was first introduced to the work of Teresa of Avila years ago now, but it opened up a world to me. And one of the truths that I learned and I realized prior to Teresa, there was my, my world prior, pre-Teresa and post, but before Teresa, before my deeper um, life into mystical truths began, um, I would never have credited the sufferings of the soul to have the impact on our health that I now see as priorities, that I now see as the leading in causes of suffering, the leading causes of spiritual crises and psychological crises. Now, I think these are the main causes of our suffering. And for Teresa, she recognized that the fear of being humiliated, and we're going back 500 years, the fear of being humiliated held such authority in people then as it does now, and probably always has, was such a handicap that it needed to be addressed first and foremost in a human being in order as the first stage of a true spiritual journey that in order and this when i say liberation this is what she wanted her nuns to liberate themselves from this fear of being humiliated because how else in her world how else could you hear outrageous holy guidance if in fact you were so afraid of the voice of heaven. And here's the reason. And it's not a religious one. It's a fact of the mystical world. The difference between the mystical world, there's so many, but I'm going to highlight this one. One of the characteristics of the mystical world is that it is not anything like this physical, rational world. It is, it doesn't operate by logic or by <clears throat> by logic or by order or by um, the rational behavior the very reason a human being prays for intervention or intercession is because a human being requires the kind of help that is cannot be had by some force in the physical world and we call this a miracle or we call this intervention we we ask for the kind of assistance that a human being is incapable of offering. And it's not logical. And it doesn't happen through logic. It happens through mystical intervention. 
mystical. And if a person is bound by the fear of being humiliated, then what they're terrified of is, I, how, how, how will I get help? I mean, I might be embarrassed. I might, something, something crazy might happen. So what will people think? And you have no idea what a handicap that is to the way heaven can help you. If in fact you are putting human restrictions on the way the non-physical world can work, you, you, you have no idea. You, you're saying, just make sure, just make sure that I'm never humiliated, that it's safe, that I don't lose money, that, so you want heaven to operate by the same rules earth does to save your pride, to protect you. And that is exactly how heaven never works. Never, never has, never will. Which is why personal liberation probably begins with recognizing that the hell with the fear of being humiliated, the goal is to be humble, to be humble, to think I, I cannot afford to give my power away to a need for approval, to have someone's approval, to, to worry about whether or not um, I'm wrong. I need to be able to follow what my inner guidance is telling me what my inner instincts are telling me, what I think is right, what I think is fair. The, the type of interior life where you build on your intuition versus asking other people permission to live your life, to, to be creative, to have a creative idea. This is the kind of liberation people are actually seeking. You're actually seeking. You're actually seeking that kind of wild permission to be fully, fully you and to discover all the incredible possibilities that you have. You're, you are actually deeply fascinated by that. I can't, you know, when I, when I see the way People used to dress, you know, these restricted big collars and corsets and long dresses and all, all this restricted clothing to restrict every part of us, restrict our breathing, restrict our thinking, restrict the restrictions that just held us in and, and restricted protocols and everything so that we just all were smothered together so that we all behave together. We all follow the same protocol and the dreams people had of what it would be like to not be that way. Personal liberation, I think, is this passion that oftentimes gets mistaken by becoming an intellectual seeker. By I think I'll read more books. I think I'll travel more. I think I'll do this. I think I'll do that. All of these external sojourns that are actually substitutes for really wanting to be a fully free human being on the inside, which means free to, to even, I mean, I, re, I remember the one story that I, I love to tell. I love to tell this story. This, um, when I was writing Invisible Acts of Power and I asked people to submit stories to me of how they spontaneously helped somebody or were spontaneously helped by someone. And I expected to get, you know, 200 letters, but I got 1,400 in a few days. I mean, and I have to tell you, reading these letters from people were like reading what I would call contemporary scripture because people couldn't wait to share these stories that were in their own way micro-miracles of you, and you wouldn't believe when this person came and this person came. But this one story, many stories stood out, but I love this one. This was this young man wrote it, but he wrote it later as an older, he, he was in his 20s. But he, he was telling a story about when he was around 13 years old and he left home. He, would, he had a little snit with his parents and he decided, that's it, I've had enough. So he leaves home and he, you know, he's just wondering, where's he going to go? He's 13. 
and um, he's walking through the town and he hears this, this homeless guy go, psst, psst. and he looks and he looks and he sees this homeless man say, Hey, psst, come here. And his first thought was who's looking at me. So he looks around to see if anybody is watching him watch this homeless man. And this homeless man says, no, come here, kid, you know, come here. And his first thought was, well, what will people say if they see me talking to you? Right? What will people say? What will people say? <clears throat> so he decides the heck with that. And he finally, he had no idea that this was a critical decision point in his life. He had no idea. Because that's how heaven works. This is how these setups work. So he finally goes over to this man. And he, and he sits there and this homeless man says, Hey, w would you just do me a favor and, and walk with me to that other bench? No reason, no rhyme or reason. They start walking together. And this homeless man says, So, you know, tell me about yourself. And this kid breaks out into all about me. Well, my parents and I left home and they just don't understand me. And da 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 So this this homeless man says, well, you know, parents have a way of becoming smarter as you get older and, and you'll understand. And they probably love you. You probably have a gorgeous home, really, and a wonderful life. And, and you'll just get through this. And, and, and so this kid said, well, yeah, you know, you know, well, they're, they are, they, they're nice. They have, yeah, I suppose they understand me. Yeah. He's, and this man says, you just have to give them a little compassion. You know, they're doing their best. And here he is representing the parents. So then they get to this other bench and they're talking and this and this kid says, Yeah, well they're you know, they're not that bad and so they and the and this kid says, So where do you live? And he says, Anywhere. Mm -hmm. And and this kid says, You know, I'm kinda hungry. He says, I am too. He says, But I don't have any money. And this kid digs in his pocket and he says he has enough for a hamburger. So he runs and he got some McDonalds or something and they split this. And and uh and then the sun's going down. He says, I, you know, I, I think I should probably get going home. And he said, I think you should too. He said, I think your parents are probably worried about you. And, and, and you'll see, he says, things are going to be fine with your parents. You'll see they're, 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 you know, and he's all this supportive of his parents. And he said, you have to be kind with them. I think you should appreciate all the things they've done. So he says to this man, well, where are you going to go? He says, wherever I want, I wander. So he looks at him and he runs home. And by the time he gets home, he has this whole sense of love and appreciation for his parents. And he apologizes to them for, for having run away and all this. And then he tells them, I met this man. And this man, and he, and he, he was homeless, but he, he was so kind and he was so generous. And he told me, and I really love you and I'm so sorry. And his mother said, where's this man? He says, well, I left him on this fence. And she said, go get him. She suspected maybe it was an angel. Well, the kid runs back, and he couldn't find him, and he never saw him again. But this, the gift of that man, who said he made him appreciate his life, his parents, his inability, his, his, the courage to make a choice, to, to think, I was so afraid to talk to you, and you changed my life. And I was so afraid. That is what liberated him that day. He felt that he was liberated from that point on to never listen anymore to what people might think. Because if he had, he would never have met this wonderful man that he never saw again. I think that when we feel that we can't reach that point of liberation, where we are in a conversation with someone and we really desperately want to say something that's coming from our heart, but we repress it, we think, oh, what will they say? Or we have a great creative idea and we think, oh, we better not. Or, or maybe it just won't work anyway. However it is, we rain on our own parade. We don't liberate ourselves. In order to live with that, we oftentimes have to become angry, angry at ourselves angry at someone, blame someone for why we are not free to be everything we were born to be. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to leave you with thinking about personal liberation and the freedom it gives you 
to see people in their beauty, to see the world the way you want to see it, that you don't have to you don't have to have perfection to see perfection. You don't have to have perfection in anything to decide I can make this moment better. I can I can see good wherever I am. Nothing on the outside can control your capacity to liberate you yourself from anything because you control that on the inside. You do. That's the power of you. That's the power of you. Personal empowerment is one stage. The capacity to manage the chaos of the outside world. But the real power is liberating yourself on the inside. Thank you, everybody.